Chief Master Sergeant Richard Etchberger took an oath to serve the U.S., even if it meant holding a secret so close that only his wife and a few select military members knew. When he died in 1968, few knew of the heroic actions done by this radar operator, especially his own family. Well, he grew up Depression era, worked for his uh, father at a five and dime store in, in Little Hamburg, Pennsylvania. Uh, would go hunting and fishing and camping in the woods with his, with his high school buddies, just kind of like what every kid did. He was a bright guy. He was, he was smart. He was uh, uh, witty. I don't think he had, a, had an enemy in school. He was a friend to everybody. He and his uh, high school buddy, Don Yoakum, decided they were going to join the Navy because they loved those white uniforms. And between the time he was 16 or 17, for some reason that nobody can figure out, he decided to go with the Air Force instead. The field he went into was electronics, and it was called radar bomb scoring. The idea was, how can we get more accuracy out of dropping bombs from a plane? When he and my mother married, I was 12. And we uh, traveled from Utah to, to Africa to North Dakota. I really enjoyed growing up in that that lifestyle, being in a lot of places. But he was quiet, he never raised his voice. For me, he really commanded respect because, probably because of that. One thing that was really neat about him is he would always bring home this equipment. He'd bring home like canteens and the web belts and air mattresses and in one respect he would sort of get us involved with the kinds of the life that he led and you know what his life was about. In 1967, as American involvement in Vietnam was reaching its peak, Chief Etchberger volunteered for a mission unlike anything he and his family had ever encountered. The mission in Laos was dropping bombs close to Hanoi on enemy territory, or enemy targets. From what I understand, they were looking for the top radar uh, people at the time, and I believe he, he was from what I've been told. When this mission came up, we didn't know it was different, except for he moved us back to his hometown, he moved us back to Hamburg, Pennsylvania, which was entirely out of the ordinary. Because of the extreme nature of the mission, Chief Etchberger's wife, Catherine, was invited to the Pentagon. They brought all the wives in because they wanted to make sure that the, wives, that the men had the, uh, the backing from their wives. The military men and the wife signed a secrecy agreement she wouldn't disclose anything that she knew until the mission was declassified. So she kept that promise to my father in the Air Force. My mother was that kind of person. If she made you a promise, she'd keep it. You know, just She never said a word to any of us. The GI, which I was one of, uh, signed a blanket extension in the Air Force and resigned from the Air Force. The official story was Chief Etchberger was working at an air base in Thailand. Like most military families, Chief Etchberger's children were used to long absences. It's hard to think back to when I was 10 years old that dad was leaving, uh, I don't know if it was for a month or six months, but I do know that he, he was gone for periods of time where mom kind of ran the show. Uh, Steve at that time had been uh, come back to uh, North Dakota. He was getting ready to go in the Air Force. So we were with, we were with our mom quite a bit at times. Where he went and what he did, uh, I, have, I have no idea. But this last absence would not be temporary. Well, we were sitting uh, at, at a, the dining room table in Hamburg, Pennsylvania, um, and we had just gotten done eating dinner, and she had just served a strawberry shortcake. My mother received a phone call. And the gentleman on the other end uh, asked if he could speak to Mrs. Edgeberger, and I handed the phone off to her. And she took the phone off the wall and about a minute later started crying. And then she broke the news to my brother Richard and I that he'd been killed. The same day I was told he was killed was the day my daughter was born. So I had just come out of the hospital with getting my first, first baby and uh, just called my mother and about two hours later she called me back with this news. So at that point in time I, <laughs> I was you know, real conflicted as far as my emotions. I was heartbroken at what happened. I cried about it. I felt terrible, you know. It, uh, it, 
We didn't know where he was, of course, but we knew that he was, he was dead. And I've never eaten strawberry shortcake since then. We didn't know any of the details at that time. It came eventually, the story that I was told was that, was that he was killed in a helicopter accident somewhere in Southeast Asia. And I actually believed that story for another 18 years. When Dad's body came back, uh, they had an open casket viewing for him, which when I think about it now, I'm helicopter crash, he looked perfect. Uh, that, that totally made, makes sense to me now, but as a 10-year-old kid again, I had no reference point for what someone looked like in a helicopter crash. The true story would remain a secret for 18 years. Richard Etchberger's story didn't end with his death. Decades later, as details of the Vietnam War that were once held secret began to see the light of day, the truth of Chief Etchberger's actions were finally revealed. I pretty much knew that it wasn't just a helicopter crash that, that killed him. The time that really made an impact on me is when Tim Castle called me, and he wanted to know at that point if, if I wanted to hear the story about my father. In 1967, the Air Force had a serious problem, and that was that President Johnson wanted the Air Force to conduct a bombing campaign against North Vietnam to stop the flow of men and materiel down the Ho Chi Minh Trail. The problem for the Air Force was that President Johnson had also decided for political reasons that B-52 bombers could not be used in that air campaign. What they decided to do was turn to a radar bombing system to use that system effectively against targets in Hanoi, they had to place the system within 120 nautical miles of its target. To do that, they either had to place the equipment in the Gulf of Tonkin on a ship, or they had to place it in Laos, which under the Geneva Accords of 1962 was a violation. In order to avoid any treaty violations, Chief Etchberger and the other airmen in his crew resigned from the Air Force, at least on paper, and went to work for defense contractor Lockheed Aircraft Services. But their real job was up in Laos, and up there they wore civilian clothes, and they were technically civilians. The facility was called Lima Site 85. The site sat atop a mountain with sheer cliffs on three sides. Its remoteness was critical to its survivability, since the site was only 15 miles from the border with North Vietnam. So we took over and commenced running missions. Uh, we'd have frags come in, drop uh, such and such aircraft with such and such weapons on it on such and such target at maybe it was a rail yard 20 miles right outside of downtown Hanoi. I mean, just various targets wherever we got missions for. The North Vietnamese military were quick to catch on. About January of 68, we got attacked by biplanes. Hmm. Snoopy, here we come. The Red Baron's got you. The attack ended with the only CIA air-to-air -air combat kill when an Air America helicopter shot down one of the biplanes. The failure of the airstrike didn't deter North Vietnamese forces. So it went on and they was building roads uh, closer and closer to us. We was dropping bombs to protect ourselves. On the night of 10 March 1968, a group of specially trained Vietnamese commandos climbed those cliffs, surrounded the, uh, the radar site, and at three o'clock in the morning, they started shooting into those vans, and there was absolutely nothing that the technicians could do. Most of the Air Force crew on duty were killed. The off-duty crew, including Chief Etchberger and Sergeant John Daniel, were hiding on a ledge along the side of the mountain. During the night, we could hear uh, small arms and grenades going off on top. After that, we didn't hear anything except voices we could not understand. We're the only ones alive. And about that time, we started receiving small arms fire. The radar technicians at Site 85 were just that. They were not combat skilled folks that had received any kind of real weapons training. Well, Gish was hit again. His was fatal. I was hitting both legs. Stan was hit. And he said, Monk's going. I said, Dick, we're the only ones alive. He said, I know it, John. I know it. I said, what are we going to do? And if it had not been for the heroism of Dick Etchberger, in taking an M16 rifle and protecting his comrades, it's quite clear that they probably all would have been killed. And about daylight, or when we could start seeing, uh, Air America chopper came in. 
It was the first chopper there and he happened to see us. It came in, went into a hover, and dropped a hoist down to Dick Etchberger and the people that were next to him at that point. As Dick Etchberger finally got ready to go up as the last person, Willie Husband, another technician who had been hiding throughout the battle, ran down the path and jumped on the hoist along with Dick Etchberger. So the two of them went up into the hoist. So we lifted off, and as we was lifting off, uh, one of them come up and emptied his weapon through the bottom of the chopper and one round hit Dick then, the first time he'd been hit. Chief Etchberger bled out before he could get further medical attention. Since Congress created E-8 and E-9 pay grades in 1958, no other E-9 in any of our other military services has ever been awarded the Medal of Honor. Chief Etchberger is the first. I really thought about this uh, over the years that, uh, you know, how much difference does a bullet going that far different make? And legends like Chief Etchberger serve as role models for an entire new generation of airmen. Chief Etchberger was not a person that, that sought notoriety. He was not a person who was looking for a pat on the back. He was looking to get the job done. It would be a good day for Chief Etchberger and his people if nobody ever found out about what they did because it was all supposed to be secret. Nobody was ever supposed to know what they did. And they all recognized that, they accepted it, they signed documents that said that this would always be secret, and that's the way they preferred it. I would love to, uh, I would love to sit down with my dad and have a beer and, uh, you know, shoot the bull with him and, and uh, cause I know he, I know he was a really uh, great Air Force guy, but he's also, Pretty cool dad. <laughs>